Welcome to Follow to Lead, where we discover how to listen for and follow God's call so that we might lead others to God. Our shared stories of inspiration from religious leaders and those active in the educational ministry of the church can help you know better how God is calling you and the role passionate Catholic education plays in spreading His message of faith, hope, and love. Now please welcome the hosts of Follow to Lead, Father Randy Sly and Kyle Pietrantonio. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Christ the Teacher, teach us to listen. Teach us to do the deep listening to the sounds of our soul, waiting to hear you calling us to cast out deeper, to become fishers of men and women, shepherds of souls, to follow your will in order to lead others to the truth, beauty, and goodness only you can offer. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome to Follow to Lead, a journey twice a month into the world of Catholic education and uh, also uh, exploring our faith and what it means to follow God in order to lead others to Him. I'm Father Randy Sly, your host. And today we're going to be talking with Francis X. Mayer, a senior fellow at the Catholic Studies Program at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C., where his work focuses on the intersection of Christian faith, culture, and public life, with a special attention to lay formation and action. And Mr. Mayer served as senior advisor and special assistant to Archbishop Charles Chapu uh, for 23 years in Denver and in Philadelphia. He previously served as editor-in-chief of the National Catholic Register and as a story analyst and screenwriter based in Los Angeles. A graduate of the University of Notre Dame and New York University School of the Arts, he is a former fellow of the American Film Institute's Conservatory for Advanced Film Studies and the inaugural, uh, inaugural Senior Research Fellow at Notre Dame Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. That was back in 2020 to 2022. He's also a founding member of uh, the board for the University of Pennsylvania's Collegium Institute for Catholic Thought and Culture, and a board member of the Napa Institute, as well as the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. Uh, his byline work has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, First Things, National Review, The American Spectator, The Catholic Thing, Crisis, This World, America, and so many other publications. And uh, he has a brand new book called True Confessions, Voices of Faith from a Life in the Church that was just released in February and is the main reason for our program today. So, Fran, welcome to the program. Well, I'm delighted to be with you, Father. Thank you and, for having uh, me on. As we begin, we like to give our guests an opportunity to share a little bit about themselves. Because you uh, could you tell us just a little bit about your upbringing? Sure, I'm uh, one of four kids. Uh, uh, I was brought up uh, when my parents had just reached the reached into the middle class. I mean, they were older. They went through the um, the Great Depression, and um, I had a very different experience from my older two sisters, I mean, who were raised during the Depression. I mean, when I came along, we were, we had just made it into the middle class. So uh, the, uh, I got a very good education, heavily Catholic education. My mom particularly was a very devoted Catholic, um, classic Irish Catholic, uh, very deeply Catholic, and, and had a really good sense of history, which I find a lot of people today don't. So it was just a great experience. My dad was a convert from Lutheranism, so uh, he was also committed, but uh, obviously not as well educated in the faith as she was. Um, so from, uh, you know, I, I had, I never intended to end up where I am. I thought I was going to be a, first of all, a philosopher, uh -huh. I was big money in philosophy. Uh, and <laughs> after that, it was going to be, uh, after that, it was going to be a screenwriter. And I did that for six years. Uh, and then I stumbled into a job as a copy editor uh, and and proofreader for the National Catholic Register. Six months later, I was the editor in chief, and I did that for 15 years. So that was the that's the that's the bizarre course that I've taken in my life. And so now you're uh, you and your wife live in the Philadelphia area still. Is that right? Yes, we live in the northern part of uh, the Philadelphia Archdiocese, right up near the uh, Delaware River. Okay, that's beautiful country up there. I'm sure you're enjoying that. Oh, it is. It's gorgeous. You know, the uh, the thing I thought about is that that trajectory from film and 
the what you were doing as a screenwriter and then moving into uh, journalism with the National Catholic Register, that seemed like a, a pretty dramatic trajectory. How did that how did that really come about? Did you have a desire to kind of go into the Catholic world or, or where did that come from? Not really. No. I mean, pardon me one second. <clears throat> no, uh, the, the, one of the uh, producers I had worked for uh, needed uh, needed part time work when he was out of work, because, I mean, you don't there's you're, you're employed for a project and then you're out of work, you know. So John uh, took a job as advertising director for the National Catholic Register, which at that time was owned by uh, the Frawley family in the Los Angeles area. So we were based in L.A. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had worked for John on a project and he said, well, you know, if you need some money, you come to work and I'll, I'll use you as a part time copy editor. So I ended up there. I, I found myself tremendously interested in it. And um, and then it just kind of dropped into my lap. It was a really exciting time, Father, because I started in uh, September of 78 uh, and Paul VI died shortly thereafter. And of right. course, then John Paul I was elected. He died almost immediately. And so then Wojtyla was elected Pope. So it was just a, I mean, it was really an exciting, exhilarating time to, to, to begin a career. And then I just got hooked. Oh, absolutely. And I would think with, uh, you know, the advent of uh, St. John Paul II's uh, papacy, that just led to all kinds of uh, of intriguing things in terms of reporting and what's going on in the life of the church. So and he was a, he was a particularly interesting character because of his background. I'm a history addict and knowing the history that he went through um, his experience of two totalitarian regimes and uh, his shrewdness in navigating the church through those regimes is just very, very, it made him a tremendously interesting person for me. Mm -hmm. Today uh, on, on the program, what we really want to do is talk about this new book of yours, True Confessions, uh, Voices of Faith from a Life in the Church. I have to say that as I was reading it this week in my office here at the church, as people came in and they saw this book and it says True Confessions, they kind of gave me a, a sort of a funny look because <laughs> <laughs> I had to explain the rest of the title for it so that they yeah. understood that, uh, number one, I wasn't, uh, you know, going someplace I shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but it, it's interesting. Uh, this book had such an impact on me. Uh, it's Basically, to kind of give it in a nutshell, you interviewed 103 bishops, priests, deacons, and lay people from right. every walk of life. And um, with all the criticism that's been going on in the American church, uh, one of the things that your publisher, Ignatius Press, points out is that nobody really took time to to really talk to the people in the church and find out what's yeah. really going. So there was this kind of a vacuum in when the, which the criticisms were given. How did this come about? How did you get the idea to do this kind of a book? Well, it's it's, it's an interesting story, Father, because, you know, when I first uh, thought about it, I was going to do Fran Mayer's grand analysis of the Catholic Church in the United States, except other people have already done that really well. And, <laughs> uh, and I yeah. already publish a lot of my own thoughts, so I didn't need to replicate that. And then another friend of mine, another EPPC scholar, did a wonderful survey of American priests, sociological survey of American priests about a year or two ago. And um, so I didn't want to replicate his work. So I thought, well, nobody's actually talked to people in depth and um, turned that into a kind of a, a 360 degree view of the Catholic Church in the United States. So that's the reason that I went and approached, the, approached it the way that I did. Now, as I was reading through the book this week, uh, I have to say that my my range of emotions went from joy to despair <laughs> and just about everywhere in between as I, I read the various testimonies. What did you experience as you were actually going through the interviewing of these people? Oh, I loved it because they were honest. You know, I mean, the, I, for the audience that's listening or, and watching, I mean, it's very important to stress the fact that if you read this book, you're going to come away from it, I think, uh, hopeful, not not distressed. I mean, the, 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 the point of, of doing the book was to kind of have an opportunity to explain my own hopefulness. I mean, my experience after working in and around the church for 45 years is um, one of deep satisfaction with the people that I, I, I worked with. I went to the, to, the, to the work and then I also went into the book worried that what I was going to find out was going to somehow dent my 
my hope. And exactly the opposite has been the right. case. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just been the people that I, I talk to, the priests, the bishops, the lay people, they're all very faithful people. And they all um, really believe what the church teaches and attempt to and, and attempt to live it. Now, I make the point, I make this point all the time. I've been married for 53 years and to a fantastic woman. It's been a great marriage, <clears throat> you know, but a good marriage does not exclude candor. In fact, it requires it. And on it, because you, you know, commitments are built on truth and you have to tell each other the truth. And sometimes it's not very pleasant. Right. So uh, I, I kind of try to explain to people that that's our relationship in the church as well. We have an obligation to respect each other and to love each other, but that doesn't mean that we need to be stupid. I mean, we have to be faithful, mm -hmm. but we also have to be truthful. And that means that sometimes we have to be pretty blunt. And uh, I found that uh, that was exactly the kind of spirit that people brought to the conversations that I had. It was interesting in, in all of the reading that there was this passion to want to keep the faith alive that there was an investment in the church that wasn't going to go away, even if they were frustrated or concerned about things, that it wasn't that they were going to leave the church, just the opposite, that they became even more committed. But w many of the interviews, one of the things that I felt, uh, there were, as particularly in comments uh, currently on the Vatican, one of the scriptures that ran through my mind was uh, from Matthew chapter 9, as I was reading some of these, and that's where Jesus um observes that uh, the people were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that a fair assessment of where a lot of people in America are feeling right now? Sure. Uh, and that goes, it depends on the leadership in your diocese, and it also depends on uh, personal attitudes toward the Holy See right now. I mean, it, and for that matter, it applies in parishes too. I mean, one of the things that Catholic Leadership Institute, uh, and they've done more, you know, several hundred thousand interviews to reinforce this. The parish, a parish survives and thrives dependent on the quality of the pastor, you know, right. and it doesn't matter about money. It doesn't matter about ethnicity or race. Um, it's strictly the pastor. If you have a zealous, committed pastor who communicates his love to his people and listens to them, uh, you're going to have a successful parish and you can say the same thing about diocesan leadership and and leadership from the holy see i think people today are uh the, the, you know there's a lot of ambiguity coming out of the holy see that that i think troubles people it gets them distressed i didn't find any infidelity none right. at all yeah yeah uh nobody's disloyal to the pope um but but there is concern about Confu there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of uh, ambiguity that about what it is we're supposed to be doing and what 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 the Pope is actually teaching. So it it's um, it's a confusing time, and that's compounded, Father, as you well know, by the by the acceleration of scientific and technological breakthroughs. There's no solid ground for people to stand on. So what you do find is a lot of resentment, a lot of anger. I'm not talking about in the church, I'm talking about in the culture at large. There's just a really tumultuous time, very similar to um, kind of reformations in the past, because that's what we're living through. We're li living literally through a reformation of the way we think about ourselves in culture, you know. Exactly. One of the things that I was impressed about is that the book was as much about kind of a cultural report as well as a report about the church that our church is based in a culture, as you're saying, where uh, we're kind of moving from uh, science to scientism, things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, one of the uh, terms that was referenced by a few bishops and others was that we're living in a Gnostic age. Yes. What, what, would, uh, what would they mean by that? Well, you mentioned it, the word that you used a moment ago, scientism, is a perfect example of that Gnosticism. I mean, the Gnostic impulse, um, historically, and it's been, uh, there have been iterations through it throughout uh, Christian history. It's really kind of like the, the core heresy that the church deals with, you know, the idea that um, a, uh, an enlightened group of people has some sort of special knowledge that gives them the right to lead, 
you know, and it takes different forms. Uh, right now, this kind of scientific um, addiction that excludes the idea of God is a form of the Gnostic heresy that's been dogging the church right from the first century, you know. Right. Um, and I think that's what the bishops are talking about. We're com so committed to technology and science that we no longer think there's any other kind of knowledge that's useful. And that's just really a fundamentally anti-human perspective. And so we have a church that is basically being bombarded from the outside. Again, that's that, uh, you know, as a one translation, harassed and helpless, harassed is where we're being pressured. And so what we're really looking for or needing in the inside is something to really hold us together and hold us up as as Catholics. And I think that's the thing that was so intriguing about the book is uh, the commitment to really maintain the, our Catholicity, to maintain uh, where we're going as a church, and to continue to hold strong in the midst of a culture that's trying to compress us. And yeah, you know, I mean, Tocqueville, uh, I, I quoted this somewhere in the book, I think, certainly some of the comments that I've made um, since since writing the book. I mean, Tocqueville made the point in Democracy in America that uh, if you don't believe in a God, you're going to be serving. If you believe in God, you will be free. And And he wasn't particularly Christian in his analysis. He was just saying that the biblical God is basically a guarantee of human human freedom because it elevates the human, belief in God elevates human dignity above uh, simply human politics and culture. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think the church is part of that elevation, it gives us the, it gives us the uh, culture, the interior culture in order to, to live that kind of deeper freedom. One of the things that the interviews really portrayed is the impact of the COVID pandemic. Oh yeah, on the church. Uh, from what you gathered from all of the different uh, comments that were made, uh, how do you think the church might respond the next time if a similar scenario were to come about? I think, in general, the people that I talked to felt that the church caved into uh, civil authorities too easily. Mm -hmm. shut down when we shouldn't have shut down. I mean, you had abortion clinics and, and uh, uh, alcohol stores staying open and we were closed. That, that's just completely nuts. Uh, you know, and I think, I think the one theme that I found from a lot of people was that uh, was a disappointment that the bishops had folded that quickly in terms of jumping on board with the restrictions when there's nothing more important in life than worshiping God and celebration of the Eucharist. I think you brought out in the book, too, that, uh, for example, the Orthodox Church uh, took a different tack. Yes. And, and, that, and a number yeah. of Protestant churches did as well. Right. The, um, the book is really rich with a variety uh, of uh, comments and, and perspectives. You, you know, as you talk to bishops, priests, you talk to philanthropists, business yeah. leaders, parents, all of these unique and different things. What were a few surprises that came to you in some of the comments that they've made? Oh boy, I, the, the um, I, candidly, the biggest surprise I had was that um, was that the results were more positive than I thought they were going to be. The second biggest surprise was just that they talked as candidly as they did. You know, I mean, the bishops were a special case because I, I when I approached the bishops, I specifically had a ground rule that they were going to be anonymous. Mm -hmm. They didn't ask for that. I asked for it. And, right. uh, and the reason for that people need to understand is that uh, bishops are in a, I'm in a really difficult position. They have to, they have to teach clearly and at the same time be very prudent in what they say, because no matter what they say, they're going to be jumped on either from the right or the left, you know? So, I mean, it's just a terrible circumstance and they have to be very careful with what they say and allow themselves to be quoted as. When I gave them anonymity, uh, and particularly having worked for a bishop for 23 years, they knew I wasn't going to burn them. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, the uh, it just made them relax and and be very frank in their comments. And and uh, if you read that first, that I guess it's the second chapter uh, mm -hmm. where I, where I interview the bishops. I mean, they're they're really good men. They're regular guys 
with different skill sets that are trying to do their best for their people. And they're, and they're very candid in their comments. And uh, it's just, you're really encountering the bishop, not simply as an, as an officer of the church or, a, or a, a shepherd of the church, but you're dealing with a human being right. mm -hmm. as, uh, who has all sorts of feelings in addition to the various skills and level of commitment that he has. I mean, one of the bishops that I talked to made a great comment about how he had been an auxiliary and uh and of course you learn on the job when you're an auxiliary but you don't have the burden of actually being a, the boss you right, know right and he, and he talked about um when you're when you're the bishop in charge it's like you're no longer in a sense even a real person you're kind of the bishop you know <laughs> which is which is like uh, in, entirely institutional in the way people treat you sometimes and and that's a burden for these guys because they're human beings like you and me you know mm -hmm. and and so I found that very, I found that really interesting. I mean, the 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 things that I I look back on most uh, with the with the most uh, satisfaction in terms of the book is uh, th those things are things like the. I mean, I think it's chapter four where we do a dissection of everything that was wrong with the archdiocese of Philadelphia. You know, mm -hmm. and the and the they were enormous problems in Philadelphia. But none of the problems, or very few of the problems, had to do with anybody being crooked or or um, um, a bad person. They were all good people and capable people who just did the wrong things for a long time in terms of administering the resources and, and the life of the church, uh, because they were trying to do. They were trying to be kind, and in the process of being kind, they were making mistakes that uh, were very very costly. Uh, so that kind of analysis of what makes a, a diocese healthy and what makes it fail, uh, I think was uh, was really useful. The other the other chapter, frankly, that really appealed to me, since we have a Down a son with Down syndrome, is the chapter I, special people where I interviewed, right? You know, parents of, of mm -hmm. people with uh, children, either who are orphans who are um, adopted or who have you know, special needs in terms of physical and mental handicaps. Those people are. I mean, they're living saints. Mm -hmm. They really are. I, I was particularly taken by that chapter as well. When I was uh, president of a high school, we had a really strong special needs program. And just to see the ways that uh, we did a peer mentoring program. So all we didn't have paras. We had peer mentors that accompanied the kids uh, through the day. So they were integrated with into the school. And to see... Some of the kids that, as they came as freshmen, they could hardly walk upstairs to yeah. be a cheerleader, you know, with the teams. <laughs> yeah, and uh, to see uh, uh, this, you know, this one young man with Downs serving as an altar server at Mass. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to have uh, a nonverbal student by the time that he had been there a few years starting to communicate. They're, these are miracles. These aren't just, um, you know, programs. These are flesh and blood miracles where God was at work. And it's it really wonderful. gives you a lot of confidence of the church because the church is yeah. one of the very few sources of consistent love and support that these kids have. You know, our I, I mentioned our son, our, our son Dan uh, has Down syndrome, but uh, you know, my wife was in addition to being a Catholic school teacher for 40 years, I mean, she was very active in the pro-life movement. And so there was never any question when we, when we learned that there was a possibility of this, but Dan is, um, uh, Dan is not a problem in the way problems can actually see. I'm yeah. uh, seeing him. I mean, what I guess where I'm going with that is, is that if you read the interview with Ursula and Matt Hennessy, you know, um, they have a daughter Magdalena that, uh, Matt has written about. He works for the Wall Street Journal. Um, and Magdalena has Down syndrome, but she also has other complications that are really, really difficult to live with. Uh -huh. And and uh, the beauty in that interview is not only the, com the, the, the deep love that these two the parents have for that child, but the candor in talking about it. I mean, there's no, they don't whitewash the difficulty at all, you know, and that 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 truthfulness makes their witness that much more powerful. Uh, and I, I was uh, I'm always moved when I interview that when I when I 
um, reread that uh, interview because that's, I think somewhere in the book I talk about, you know, we have a tendency to see, talk about the cloud of witnesses as being in heaven, but they're all around us. Sure. And, and, uh, and that's a perfect example of it, uh, that, that particular chapter. One of the other areas that I really enjoyed reading about, uh, as a former high school pres president, I was <laughs> always into raising money. That was a part of it. And to, uh, to read the chapter of the part on the philanthropists. And I was particularly taken by the fact that they really, uh, as they give their money, isn't just giving money that they really feel a participation and an ownership in the mission of the church. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how did you, in that type of an environment, what, what did you take away from those interviews that uh, really are helpful for a lot of us? Well, again, that's, a, it's a source of hope, not, not depression, you know, I right. mean, these are, there, there, there's a lot of Catholic wealth out there and um, sometimes it's misused. We're human beings, you know, but, but uh, there's a lot of uh, devotion to the church among wealthy people. And they, they, they want to be productive with their, with their wealth in terms of assisting the church. Now, I think one of the, uh, I think Tim Bush is one of the gentlemen that I interviewed and Tim <clears throat> made the point of his donations are really investments in the church. Exactly, I think that's yeah. true, you know, that means that um, he's giving of his wealth to, to invest in the services of the, of the church, but he also expects some responsibility on the part of people who get that assistance. He wants to be productive through them. And so it's not like, here's a bunch of money, now go do what you want. I mean, the, the donors typically want to be involved in, in developing the fruitfulness of, of the money that they've, that they've given to people. And uh, I think people who are starting apostolates need to know that because if they, if there's a, there's a certain degree of ingredients that have to be mixed in order to make an apostolate effective. One of them is money. And when you're dealing with uh, wealthy people who want to invest, they want results. They want to see you actually do what you said you were going to do. Yeah. It isn't just about enthusiasm and passion, but there's no. <laughs> actually got to be follow through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was intrigued with how many of them really wanted to make sure that the team was all on, on yeah. you know, they were all uh, hired for mission, not just there to, you know, have a job. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I use the example of the, the Children's Crusade right at the beginning of that chapter. And if you know mm -hmm. anything about the history of the Children's Crusade, it was a great idea liberating Jerusalem. Uh, but uh, very poorly planned. You know, God was going to provide everything. I didn't have to think about that, you know, and, and, and it doesn't work that way. I mean, God gives you an idea, but then he expects you to use your brain and your muscles to actually uh, instantiate that idea in reality. And, and, uh, and so there's this dance between donors and donees in, in the sense of donors have to give the money. They're going to give the money to something that they believe in, but they want on the part of the person who an organization that receives the money to act responsibly to have a good leader to have a mm -hmm. good team to have a good business plan and then to actually keep reporting on how they're doing so there's engagement with the donor all those things are important ingredients to making the thing work and as we used to say in marketing uh be careful that you don't over promise an under deliver. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, that's a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. Now, a majority of our audience come from Catholic education, uh, Catholic school administrators and teachers. And what impressions uh, did you find in the interviews regarding Catholic education? Yeah, they they were. They, it was an interesting mix because uh, all, for example, the bishops. Almost, I mean, almost everybody that I talked to sees Catholic education as essential to the mission of the church. You know, and by Catholic education here, I'm talking about Catholic schools. Right. Uh, obviously, it's much larger than that. Um, the there are two issues that repeatedly came up. Number one, uh, if you're going to have a Catholic school, you have the responsibility of delivering an authentic and orthodox Catholic education. You know, if you just develop a uh, a very good academic program with a kind of a patina of Catholic identity, that, that, you know, why do that? Bishops in particular have no use for that. 
Yeah, I mean, might as well just go to another Catholic school. Exactly I mean, right. Another uh, another private school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that uh, isn't burdened by this Catholic identity thing, you know. Yeah. So Catholic schools have to be Catholic first. That's their primary mission. Otherwise, they shouldn't even exist. And of course, then they should be good at it in terms of providing a, a basically very good academic education. The the problem, of course, is that it's very expensive, and uh, as the number of Catholics that are really engaged in a parish dwindle, um, it becomes more and more difficult to sustain Catholic schools, which leads to, I mean, one bishop who, who said, uh, and this, this is a guy who is very, very supportive of Catholic schools, and uh, he said, you know, if I had my druthers, what I would do is I'd close 80% of the schools that don't do their job and take the money and invest it in other forms of shaping young people. That's a radical way of looking at it. But the, 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 two main, the two main things I came away from is, is that Catholic schools are very valuable. Okay, They need to be protected and, and sustained, but they also need to be fundamentally Catholic or, or the whole thing isn't worth doing. Right. So based on that, what do you see as key issues that Catholic schools need to address as they move forward? Well, most Catholic kids are falling away from the faith by the time they're 30. And that means that the education that they're getting isn't sufficiently deep or urgent. You know, the, by urgent, I think that's the real word that I'm talking about here. Part of the problem is, is that my generation of lay people who are now doing some of the teaching were inadequately formed, you know, uh, and that's just a problem that has to be worked out over the next 20 years in, in terms of better formation who, uh, young adults who become adults who are committed to the church and then go into education. That's part of it. But but the other part of it is, is that um, we're dealing with a really very difficult evangelical environment in that we were a mission church until 1908. And the church at that time was uh, revered because it was the protection Catholics had against a uh, a hostile, essentially Protestant environment, you know. Now, the, what what did that produce? What that produced is a Catholic church that, as the Catholic numbers grew, developed a great deal of cultural and political influence. And what happens then when you have those things is that you're tempted to become part of the furniture and then become sclerotic. And then everybody just leaves or, or they, they don't take it seriously anymore. And once that happens, your evangelical environment becomes very difficult. You've got a culture that thinks it knows about Jesus Christ, but doesn't. You know, they think that they've tried that and it didn't work. So we're going to get past that. Mm -hmm. It's different from going to Papua New Guinea and, and, and converting people who've never heard of Christ before. We're in a culture that thinks they already tried that and it didn't work. And um, it's not relevant to the current moment. And evangelizing in that in that environment is much more difficult, and we're not geared to do that right now in our in our schools. We're more in a maintenance mode. Would that be a fair way to look yep. at it? And that's fundamentally defensive, and it's never work. It never works. You know, if right. you're not, if you don't have a zeal, an outward focus zeal, an evangelical attitude. You might as well just pack it in. It's not going to work. It's interesting that uh, I didn't pick up in the book anybody worrying about if we got smaller that that would be necessarily bad but no i mean that we they, just need to be more essential to our faith right that's right i mean the the remember who did i talk to i talked to people who were faithful people who were either actively practicing the faith or really sincerely trying to practice it so you know i i didn't spend much time with dissenters i didn't spend time on the uh the fringes of the church on either the right or the left, that, that those are things that um, the, 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 the mass media, the secular media already give them too much attention. I wanted to know what people who actually took it seriously think, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and that's what we did. So um, it, it uh, I think it gave a much more authentic impression of where people are, and they're not afraid of being smaller, they're afraid of it not mattering, they're afraid of right. losing their faith. One of the terms, I can't remember where it was in the book, but uh, the term came up, Catholic atheist. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I, that, which is an interesting turn of phrase, basically my understanding would be someone who goes through the outward motions of 
going to mass and all of that, but basically they live as though God doesn't exist. Correct. And that seems to be not an area of burden, but an area of concern to really reach those people and help them to come alive in the faith that they've already kind of assimilated to, at least in some way. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of uh, Catholic life, and I'm not talking just about the United States. The developed world is a, is a matter of pro forma behavior, where it's a it's either a cultural memory or it's a habit that you go through on a regular basis, but it doesn't penetrate below that to your heart and your motivation in terms of of, of living, and uh, that's. I think you have to be you have to be you have to make a conscious decision to fight against that mm -hmm. and you see that in people who uh, uh who are committed to like adoration and 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 committed to to kind of preaching the importance of the sacrament of of uh, penance because penance forces you to re-examine yourself on a regular basis mm -hmm. when i think about this book uh and think about catholic schools can you find uh some uh, ways in which we might be able to use that in our classrooms or other ways that this book might be helpful I think for it's educators. more of a uh, in classrooms uh, the the book isn't written for uh for young people it's written for right. the people who are forming in fact i i call it one of the chapters uh you know the formators or something to that right. in fact mm -hmm. i interview people who are teaching people pr primarily at the at the university level because uh but not only the university level. And I did that because that's an extremely important uh, point in young people's life in terms of choosing their life direction and where they're going to go after, you know, the, their educational year's end. Uh, right. But the, uh, I think, uh, I, I'm sorry, Father, I lost the track of what you were, what you were actually, oh, it, use in the classroom. I think that, I think, Educators will 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 get a very clear sense of what they need to do if this is used as a background text. Sure. It's not something that can be used in the classroom very easily. Right. And uh, the thing, one of the other things that was good in the book is the way that you were kind of ending it toward the final pages with things that are working. Yeah. And you po uh, you know, you focused on no pun intended focus. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know uh, that ministry, Catholic <clears throat> Leadership Institute. There's some really wonderful, hopeful signs, isn't there, for the future church? Oh yeah, yeah, and that, it was tied very, it was tied very closely, Father, to your comments about donors. I mean, you know, the point was is to here's what donors want, and then here's successful operations that reflect the best of what donors want. You know, so um, I I did Augustine Institute, uh, the Leonine yeah. Forum, and those those are all things that are that are you know, hitting all 12 cylinders. I mean, they're doing great work. And, and that's just the tip of an ice tip of the iceberg. You know, nobody pays attention to the fact that here we are talking about on zoom about exactly these things. There's hundreds of people like yourself doing this kind of work, mm -hmm. hundreds of radio stations in this country that are, that are, 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 are doing excellent Catholic work, you know, uh, and EWTN for heaven's sakes. I mean, it's just a monster, you know, and, and, um, has a tremendous impact. So the the tendency, if you if you're living in a in a, a desacralized world, which we all are, and you're getting most of your news from TV and and social media and uh, uh, and cable news, is to be depressed all the time. Oh, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. But right. it's not. That's false. And and we we just have to be conscious of of the duplicity in a lot of what's going on in the culture and realize that um unseen and unrecognized are these dozens and dozens and hundreds of apostolates that are doing really good work the one that really intrigued me and i know you had a part in it is the collegium oh yeah and the, the collegium uh you know bloom wrote a book years ago and basically saying uh that uh, universities are the black holes of society. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet, uh, here we put a, a Catholic apostolate right in a black hole. Uh, yeah. You know, and I, with no, no, uh, and you know, I know the University of Pennsylvania is a wonderful educational institution, but very secularized. But yet, uh, the Collegium again is showing we don't have to be afraid of our culture. Mm -hmm. 
we can really be a way to address it. And they've been very well received. You know, Penn is an interesting example because of all the Ivy League schools, Penn is the only one that didn't have a divinity school. You brought that so, up, yes. Yeah, so one of the what's one of the interesting dynamics there is is they don't have a religious past to be embarrassed about, <laughs> which you find at Harvard and Yale and Princeton. You know, these are all schools that had that began as divinity schools, and they moved away from that, and now they don't want anything to do with it. You know, but Penn was was founded by Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin, and uh, it was specifically founded as a non-religious institution. You know, and and in a weird way, that has actually worked in collegium's advantage because there isn't this kind of entrenched resistance to religion there. Uh, but the other thing to keep in mind uh, about a, about collegium is that it's easy to focus on everybody coming out of these schools that doesn't have any faith. Collegium is the product of guys who were educated in the Ivy League who are committed Catholics and determined to, to revivify the faith of the people around them. And, and so uh, they're not the majority, but they're really smart and, and they, they, know how to, they know how to do things and, and be successful at the construction of these apostolates. And it's just wonderful to be part of that. It would seem to me that uh, this could become a new foundation for a future uh, movement of the church that could be very, very strong in our culture. And yeah, it's by, it, it, Collegium is kind of um, an offshoot. Uh, the basic idea came out of the University of Chicago with the Lumen Christi Institute. Mm -hmm. Collegium is, is quite different and for uh, ironic reasons. I mean, Lumen Christi is, is actually attached in some way legally to the uh, Chicago Archdiocese. And Collegium uh, isn't part of, in any way, part of the the archdiocese here in Philadelphia. And the irony is, is that Archbishop Shapu wanted it that way because uh -huh. he couldn't guarantee who would follow him as a bishop. And he wanted good, solid Catholic lay people to have to be, you know, the driving force behind it. He, he personally uh, used his personal funds to help get it started, you know, but uh, it's, a, it's a completely independent institute run by authentic and very deeply Catholic uh, intellectuals and, and staff people at the university. That's one of the things that I loved as I got further into the book is that there were some wonderful victory stories, wonderful interviews with people that you just go, this this church is worth it. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. not a time to walk away. It's a time to really invest ourselves. Uh, this may be a little bit unfair, but uh, would it be possible for you to kind of extract maybe three major themes and, you know, three may be an arbitrary number that really emerged from this book. Wow. Uh, I think I can. One of the, one of them is uh, that you, something you just said, which is that um, things are much better than people think, you know, the social media gets you completely crazy and everything's bad because otherwise, right. why would you write about it? You know, yeah, you know yeah. so I mean, that's a that's just a lie. And, and, and I think the book really proves that very powerfully. So that's one thing. Uh, the, I think, uh, and I, I keep coming back to this, but uh, candor is liberating. If you're honest, even if it hurts, it's good. Because once you know the truth, you can change, you can do something to fix things. And that was a real motivator in writing the book. I wanted people to be able to just tell the truth, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, um, and some of it's painful. There's plenty, there's a boatload of candor and criticism in the book, but there's a mm -hmm. lot more hope that emerges from that. Mm -hmm. So that's the second thing. Um, and I guess the third thing is that, um, I'd say that, uh, boy, I, fidelity is, you can't be happy in you unless you learn how to be faithful. You know, I mean, the, the, it, it's, this, it's that, that's the way it is in the, in a marriage and, and that's the way it is in the church. I mean, you, it's so hard to teach young people who are, um, uh, early in their marriage and having difficulties to, to, to believe that, um, hanging in there and sacrificing yourself for each other over a long period of time produces a tremendous joy at the end of your life. I'm sure it's the same in, in a religious or, or priestly vocation. Mm -hmm. Plenty of 
rough edges, and I'm sure you're very well aware of it. There's mm -hmm. plenty of tough times in a priestly vocation or in a religious vocation. That's precisely the time you need to hang in. Because if you do, that suffering produces tremendous fruit down the, down, down the road. And I think, um, I think that's one of the things you can, I, I, th I hope that's one of the things I captured in the book uh, as well. The importance of um, fidelity uh, in spite of the pain that it sometimes brings, you know. Oh, Fran, it's been wonderful to have you on our program today. And uh, again, uh, True Confessions, and this book is available at all of your major book outlets uh, from Ignatius Press. And uh, I hope that each and every one of you will get a copy of this and read it. Um, I just really want to encourage encourage people to do that. And for those who would like to know uh, more about Francis X. Mayer and your writings and your work, where could they go? Oh, uh, Amazon or Ignatius Press. Yeah, those websites have it, Father. Could I make one final comment, by Absolutely. the way, that's relevant yeah. to the education? I mentioned that my wife uh, was a Catholic school teacher for 40, 40 years, and she's really good at it. But uh, in order to teach religion, she also had to become very capable in teaching math because that's she worked for the National Dominicans and they said, you want to teach religion? Here's what, you, what else you have to do. So uh -huh. she did it. She was really good at it. But when you in, walked into her math class, she had this huge um, running across the top of her blackboard. And I don't know, like a uh, foot and a half tall letters to Jesus through math. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, oh, it is. It, it captures Catholic education perfectly. Yeah. You know, you teach. Yeah. The truths about the world, but you teach it through the lens of faith, and then it has meaning, not just dead data. And mm -hmm. I want to encourage Catholic school educators in your in in your diocese that um, that uh, religion is not a separate subject. It's something that should invade and infect in a good way every other subject you teach. And my wife Sue did a, uh, just a fabulous job at that, and uh, I tease her about it all the time. But she was mighty effective. <laughs> Boy, I love that. I'm going to have to pass that along to the math department here at uh, the local parish school. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and the thing is, that is uh, the whole mission of follow of follow to leads uh, organization, Duke and Altum Schools Collaborative, is to mm -hmm. uh, bring about uh, faith first, that we saturate our teachings. We did a, a series on the program, in fact, about the five marks of Catholic education, Catholic schools that Archbishop Miller put together that still... Mm -hmm. It's like evergreen material. That's great. Yeah, That's I just I, uh, so thank you for your encouragement on that, because I and I know that uh, there are so many that really see Catholic education as a key uh, to our future here. And yeah. you uh, know, the sun's rising. It's not setting. That's there you the go. Yeah. <laughs> and you still have uh, do you have a place for your other writings, a blog? Uh, ethics oh, public? sure. You know, I, I do a lot of writing for uh, first things. I'm a, I'm a contributing editor there. And and uh, also for the Catholic thing, I have a regular column there. So um, yeah. yeah, that's I, where I, I I love your stuff on Catholic thing. That's a great website for people to yeah. subscribe to. Yeah, yeah, I I, uh, I I I talk about things enough to bore even myself sometimes, but I try to <laughs> I try to I try to do it in a way that doesn't bore other people. So there anyway, you go, Father. That's thank great. you so much. Well, thank you, and uh, again. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. And for more information about the Duke and Altum Schools Collaborative, we invite you to visit our website at diaschools.org. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our podcast on your podcast platform. And be sure to leave a comment to encourage us toward future programs. May Almighty God bless you. We'd like to thank you for joining us on this episode of Follow to Lead, a production of the Duke and Altum Schools Collaborative. To learn more about finding your own path in your journey of faith, or for more information on what we discussed in today's episode, you are invited to follow us on social media and visit us on the web at diaschools.org. To provide a one-time donation or monthly pledge, please visit our website. Your gift will aid us in providing up-to-date information, additional resources, and other support on how to take Catholic education to a higher level. We look forward to helping you follow God's call to lead others to God right here on Follow to Lead.